in a world where Microsoft virtualization is still considered to be the underdog by some. The Hyper-V Amigos enlighten the IT crowds on how they could very well be mistaken. Okay. Hi, Didi. <laughs> this is our sixth episode of the Hyper-V Amigo showcast. And uh, how are you doing? Fine. I'm a bit tired, but we're, we're still going strong, tinkering with uh, the bits of VNext in the technical preview. And we're deploying some really nice systems at work. So, uh, And in the immediate future, I think I might be able to play with remote FX uh, setups with Hyper-V. So that's also always something that's very interesting to do. So a lot, so, of, lot of interesting stuff is coming uh, when we start to play with VNext, also here in the show. But today we want to do something else, not play with WeNext or the technical preview. We want to deliver a little bit about storage spaces, right? Or scalar drive yeah. server and storage spaces. I want to do that maybe three or four months ago, but I haven't had the setup right. And also now my setup is not quite perfect. But we want to do this storage space show before we start with the new stuff, right? That's a good. It's a good idea. <laughs> Let's focus on what we've got in our hands at the moment. Right? <laughs> okay, and I'm looking forward to uh, in the future two weeks. Uh, in two weeks, we will meet in uh, Redmond again to on, on the MVP summit, and we'll Absolutely. also meet the other great guys in our group. Right. I'm look, looking forward to that one. Actually, really okay. looking forward to it. So let's right go into the stuff because we have a lot of to show. Mm. I will change to the PowerPoint that, that I have uh, uh, prepared. Uh, it's only three pictures, and these three pictures okay. are showing my setup here. I have quite a lot of stuff in the moment here. Um, what uh, is has to do something with storage space. That's a it's, nice home lab, actually, Karsten. It's, yeah, uh, it's my company home lab, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> my, my home is my company, you know. So um, what we see here uh, in the upper left uh, uh, corner is our production scale-out file server. Um, it is, it, these are two HP servers, Generate 8 360, uh, uh, DL360, uh, with local disks and two processors and uh, at ev each of those has a 10 gigabit network card with two ports and some management ports. And this is a data on JBoard. And in this JBoard, we have six 200 gigabyte SSDs and 18 one terabyte uh, nearline ZAS disks. And this setup, um, um, before this setup, we had a very nice NetApp, uh, uh, a 40U NetApp, uh, fast. 6030, where even one of these NetApp heads had five U's. So 10 U's for the heads and then a lot of disks. And we replaced our NetApp with this little setup and we are very satisfied with this. Setup. We have only okay. maybe a fourth or a fifth of the power consumption now. Uh, our NetApp has, has uh, I think, two kilowatts and this has only 500 watts or so. So and do the performance have, is much better. Do you have less? Do you have larger disks now, or more SSDs than you had in the in the NetApp? In the NetApp, there were no SSDs. It's, it is a yeah. fiber channel storage system with uh, a large fiber channel disk. It's maybe five to six years old, and we replaced it. With oh, oh, there were there were there were still fiber channel disks. Quite yeah. old, actually, then. Yeah. Basically, yeah. It's an old one, yeah, but we replaced it, and uh, we will. Oops. What did I do? We will uh, look on this system. Um, I have something to show about tiering because tiering is a great, auto tiering is a great solution in storage spaces, but uh, you don't see what the system is doing. So when the auto tiering process is running, you don't get a statistic what 
does auto tiering move to between the uh, tiers and how much uh, of your tiering space is used and how much tiering uh, or SSDs would be nice to have and so on. So we will. So, ba so basically, you're going to give us some insight into how to find out information. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This information is there, but you have to know where you get it. Yeah? Okay. So on the down here, we have a setup for one of our customers. These are all Dell uh, systems. These are not the Gen 13 system that you are so fortunate to get in the near future. These are Gen 12 uh, systems. These are the, um, I think the uh, 720 uh, system. We Looks have, like it. Yeah, we have two of those are scale out file server nodes. This is a cluster and here we have three JBots, the uh, Dell 1200, MD 1200 JBots. And okay. each of these JBots has uh, four SSDs and eight HDDs. And we want to show how this behaves when we turn off one of those JBots. Now, this okay. Was, uh, this was something you want to see, right? Yeah, cool. So you, you actually have the uh, the JBot we uh, we done set up, right? You can I you can tolerate so. the JBot I, failure. I hope so. We will look. Nice, we will look nice, for that. Nice. I hope so. We have to uh, we have to test it. I, I'm not really sure. I hope so. And here on the uh, right side, we have another another system that we are using in our power course. This is production. This is power course equipment. Um, I'm doing a a training in Germany in my company where um, where we do mainly Hyper-V but also a lot of storage spaces and SMB3 stuff and here in the in the lower right we have uh, two HP systems these are general general generation 6 systems also with uh, 10 gigabits adapters and some management adapters and here we have an Intel JBot with five FS SSDs and I think 13 or 14 one terabyte nearline ZAP disk. And here we want to show how the how this system will handle a catastrophe. So we will pull out the power of one of those uh, um, uh, uh, file server nodes while okay. it is doing I.O. And uh, here we have some Cisco uh, servers where we have uh, the, a benchmark uh, running and uh, on top of those is some of those nice violin uh, all in flash system but uh, we will see really we'll to that. really really Carson that's nice oh this is not ours we we had a customer who wants to test this and they arranged with violin that we can do the test and nice. a colleague of mine uh, Jan uh, has done a nice article for the German IT administrator, it's a German uh, uh, IT uh, newspaper or magazine, an IT magazine, where we tested the this, this system and we will also blog about the, it in the, in early 2015. Yeah? Okay, so, so, I, so let, I, me, let, yeah? let me, let me, Again, where are we going to test basically, yeah? Uh, I would like to recap what we're going to do. So over here, uh, we, the power quiz material, in the yeah. bottom right, we're gonna do a, basically a soft node failover. Yeah. It's a bit like your controller on your sand failing. Right. We will pull the cable of one of these nodes while yeah. it's doing all the load in the scale out file. So we will provoke oh, okay. the system that everything is running on this node, and this would be the worst case scenario. Everything is running on this one uh, node or one uh, controller. And this controller will fail, and we will see what what's happening in the in the scale out file somewhere in this scenario. Yeah. Okay, understood. On the Dell material, we're gonna make uh, a JBot fail. Yeah, right? we will. I will uh, power off one of these JBots, and we will see what's happening. So my my nice MVP wife will assist me. So I, we will we will film it with the camera. We uh, and uh, we'll, we will show it when when I turn off the switches and you see the light is going out and so on. Yeah? Okay. And here we uh, will look uh, at the stati statistics. So maybe we will start the with data the tearing. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So for that, I will change to this is the wrong system. This is again the wrong system, of course. How could it be? 
I have to connect to my so I have to connect to this system. This is my uh, or our production scale out file server. I will open the failover cluster manager and you see here we have only one role. This is a scale out file server role. He okay. has two shares for data. Yeah. I can open it a little bit more. We call it virtual disk one, virtual disk two. They both are about two and a half to three terabytes in size. And of, of course, we have a quorum disk for our uh, scale out file server. Yeah. So you see here, here are the disks. There is another disk for iSCSI boot. Uh, we are not using it in the moment, but it, uh, it is already prepared. And you see one, one virtual disk has 3.6 terabyte of data and one has 2.7 terabyte of data. And the system has some disks in it. And we look at the pool. We have some disks here and we see the 24 disks and there are some SSDs. We can see it here. These are the small ones, the 143 gigabytes. These are SSDs. Uh, I, I say, I would say six of them. And the rest are um, nearline dust disk, one terabyte nearline dust disk. So okay. you have to know every day the auto tiering. Auto tiering is uh, the file server is doing I.O. And uh, the file server is looking into the I.O. which data is hot and which data is cold. So which data is used more often. And uh, the concept of auto tiering is uh, the file server will move this hot data into SSDs and cold data into HDDs. So this is happening automatically and normally it will run every night at one o'clock. And this is a scheduled task. Uh, the system is, uh, uh, if you install um, a scale out file server with auto tiering, this task is automatically created at 1 a.m. in the morning, auto tiering will run. The problem is, we have no information what, what is it doing. Yeah? So you don't know, have I enough F SSDs or need I more or have I too much SSDs and what is happening there. Yeah? Uh, you can get this information if you run the auto tiering process manually. If you say on the command line, it's, it's in the defrag uh, tool, you can do a defrag with the right options and after the defrag, you will get a nice output of the defrag, what it has done. So uh, there is a blog post out there where Microsoft shows, shows us how to configure the task, the scheduled task to get this information. And I have written a little PowerShell script uh, where you get this information and it, it is added at, at a log file. Uh, edit at, at the end of the log file every every time the auto tiering process is running, so you can see what is my auto tiering doing. So, I will so show basically, you, the, you have the history of the tiering. Exactly. Okay. So when we go into the task scheduler library, we have to scroll down to the storage tier management, and this is the storage tier optimization. It's run at one o'clock in the evening and I change in at our system I changed it to a PowerShell command and there is the PowerShell script running. I don't see it here. So I will do edit. There there's running a PowerShell script called auto tiering dot PS1. I have to do that on both systems. So both scale out files have a node. Yeah. And you mentioned in when we talked about this that that it would be possible maybe to, to have one cluster task for that or do it as cluster task. I don't hear you, uh, Didier. Okay, you hear me now? Yes, I hear you now. Please okay. repeat. So yeah, basically a, a clustered scheduled task that would run on all nodes. That would make it perhaps management-wise a bit more. Uh, the only thing I think you'll need to do is move that script over then to uh, a cluster disk, a CSV or yeah. Something that's available on all nodes, of course. Okay. I will, I will test that uh, if I have a little bit of time. We'll see. So 
now this task, uh, this PowerShell script, uh, it's doing the same uh, the same command that is done by uh, Microsoft in the uh, scheduled task, but it will uh, will put the output in a file where you you can specify a file. I have done this under a C Windows logs. You can specify another path if you want to. And here you see the auto tiering report. And we will open that on the system. And we see I started it on the 11th of August uh, 2014. And we see every every day we have an output here. So and I will move down to the last output. And uh, here you see I have a virtual disk two. Our system has two virtual disks. Normally one virtual disk is handled by one node and the other virtual disk is handled by the other node. So if we want to see both uh, tiering reports, we have to open both uh, uh, on, on both servers. Yeah? This is for volume yeah. two. Okay. And here we see the volume size of is two, 2.7 terabytes and we have free space of 800, around about 800 gigabytes. Much imp more important is this optimization report. We see 100% of the IOs, if, if we want to have 100% of the IO serviced from SSDs, we need 95 gigabytes in SSD tier. Yeah? And I'm so happy that I have 150 gigabytes of SSD tier for this virtual disk. So the cluster has served nearly 100% out of SSD. So that's, that's so basically, really nice. Yeah. So basically that means it's optimal. This is optimal, yeah. And, and um, I, just for, for the record, so that people don't get uh, misconception, this doesn't mean that you have to be able to put all your data into the SSD tier. It just means that all the data that's hot fits into the SSD tier, right? Exactly. So if, if, we, if we now would okay. use other data that is on HDD, um, it would be recognized in the, how it's called, in the, um, uh, the system uh, looks at it and uh, saves the information uh, in, in the, I, I don't get the word. So it remembers this block is very hot. And at one o'clock, it will move uh, will move the data from HDD to SSD. And if there is not enough space in SSD, it will also move data out of SSD to the HDD. Uh, so it's nice to have enough SSD space for your hot data. But the system, you don't know uh, upfront how much SSD you need. It depends on your workload and the SSDs are normally 100% used for hot data. If you have a larger yeah. SSD uh, tier, there will be hot data, very hot data, and maybe not so hot data, but not cold data. And if it's not so large, you only have the very hot data in there, or a part of the very hot data. You know? And what I didn't remember was the heat map, of course. So the heat map oh, yeah, uh, is that built by the system. Yeah, that, that was the word that um, was missing. So here you see um, what's happening, and after the tiering process, he, he said, so now the system will serve 97% out of the SSD tier. This is quite optimal. If we look through other examples here, maybe we find uh, one that's not so optimal. No, this is very, we have two volumes here, the large one and the small one. No, I don't find, maybe we go to the first line. So here, are 55. No, it's no, it's it's quite optimal, I would say. Yeah. Okay, but I want only I want only show that. And this script, I have uh, a blog post about it. Uh, this script, uh, you can download it and uh, substitute the command in the uh, in the task plan. Yeah? This okay. was the first thing we want to show. Okay. So That's nice. the, the second one was our our cluster when we when we pull one of the nodes yeah and for that i have prepared a virtual machine on one of those cisco machines it's called a, it's a benchmark machine i prepared for all my tests there are a lot of benchmarking tools in there one of the tools is the io meter 
And Iometer has this nice, uh, ta ta we call it tachometer. Is it right in English? Yeah. Speedometer, I like speedometer. Speedometer. So, and you see here, we have some uh, 4K IOs. I, I, I uh, shoot the test where, where it did 50% read, 50% write, uh, 4K IO. It, it, the numbers are not important here. It's only to show that there is something going on. And if we have a look at the settings of this virtual machine, we see that the disks are on a share. And this share is our scale out file server, and it's actually on VDisk 2. We am benchmark zero one, and there is the disk. Uh, and the okay. other disk is also on the same share on the same scale out file server. Uh, and we, when we turn off the file server, we will look at this this uh, speedometer. What's happening here? It will fall down, and then we will see how long it takes uh, uh, takes the I/O to come back. So I need a watch here. So I will I will rearrange a little bit this screen. So we need a watch where we can see how much seconds it will take. Okay. It's a little bit tricky, of course. So we can now see the I/O meter. No, we can't. I put, we could. Something, <laughs> put something in front of it. I, uh, there it is. So this one. Yeah, there we go. Oh. I hope so. Here's our watch. We will open that, and you see the seconds. No, you don't see the seconds. Nice. How will we get the seconds? Oh, you see it. You see the seconds here. Yeah. yeah. No so this is the file server, the scale out file server. Here we see the row, scale out file server, and he's loading the shares. Hope he show them to us. Here's the virtual disk too. So actually, yep. the I/O of this virtual machine is uh, coming from these scale-out file servers, virtual disk two. And I'm on file server node one, and this is important. So I will turn off later uh, file server node two. Yeah? Our scale-out file server has two nodes: file server node one, file server node two. And in the moment, the load is spread over the bo both of these file servers. So we see our pool is on file server one. If I go to the disks here, we have three disks, one quorum, two data disks, and they yeah. are two of them are on, on file server one. One is on file server two. This is also a feature of uh, of uh, SMB 3.02 and the scale out file server that. He is spreading the loads over all the all the nodes that are there. Then we will see the role scale out file server is also ser serviced by the file server one and the current host server is all also for file server node one. So what I will do, okay. I will move all the loads to file server zero two. And you can do that if you go to nodes in a cluster and here you pause the node and drain the rows. This is, for example, if you want to patch it or uh, give it more memory or uh, do something at the network. So we will drain the host. And maintenance, whatever it is, and maintenance, right? Uh, can you please repeat it? I was saying that it's and maintenance. Whatever it is you're doing, patching or uh, reaching the server, it's planned. It's not a catastrophic. No, no, we will plan now. We, we take it out of, uh, so we pause everything on it. We see it here. There is no pool, no disk, no roles. And then we look here in our cluster is now the current host server is the, the second one. Uh, the role, the scale out file server is now on the second one. All the disks are served from the second one and the pool. Everything is now on the second file server. And now I need the assistance, assistance from my for my wife, she is also an MVP, but only for the public cloud. But she will help me and film how I will. Uh, <laughs> Do you see Kerstin? Can you see I her? I see her. <laughs> Hello. So now we have to do a video.
And for the video, we need video. So we will now go to the file server. Didier, I can hear you over my microphone. Okay. And cool. you will do a countdown. Where are the seconds here? So that we, maybe, that we maybe are on a, on a timer where we can uh, see how many seconds it will take. Yeah? So okay. not here. You have to come with me. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, we will go to the server. So, no, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I missed something. First, I want to, I want to um, unplug the power of file server node 2. So if our file server node 1 will, uh, is paused, a catastrophe will happen. There is no, no other yeah. hold, node that can be um, can be used for the workload. So I will resume the node, but not do not fail rolls back. So I do Understood. that, and everything will still be on the file server too. Okay. Okay. So we will go here on this. You see that this is the I/O, and now we will change the room. Mm -hmm. Please come with, come with me. You follow me closely, nice. So, oh my God, I don't know what's happening there, but yeah, I'm now in, uh, in in the room with the server. Person, you have to you show this service here. Um, here's a all happening. Oh, here's an SSD. Uh, no, it's okay. And I will pull the file server node 2. It's the upper one. Mm -hmm. I hope so, it's right. So I will go on the other side. Did you, you want to do a countdown to some. It's the upper one, yes? File server 2 is the upper one, okay? Mm -hmm. So, did you, you give us the command when I, when I should uh, unplug the server? Ready? Yes? Now! So what happens? Okay, so we have zero IOPS now on the virtual machine. Okay. This one. And we are looking at the uh, cluster yep. GUI to see what's happening there. We still see that the owner is... Ah, it switched over and we have IOPS again. So that was rather fast. That was about 20 seconds. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? So the, That's nice. The, the other server is still down. Uh, I can, of course, Replug it, uh, plug it in again, yeah, and uh, we will see it will come back, it will come up, and uh, um, please wait, my love. We have to do another video, <laughs> uh, uh, so it will come uh, online again, and we'll do I/O again, and we'll get it to watch with this. But we only want to show um, what happened if there is catastrophe. No, how are you? Catastrophe. Okay. So, so in the basically, moment, basically, basically, does this mean that my VM uh, stalls for twenty seconds? But that's the worst that's happened. That's yeah. happening to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's the worst. It's cool. If it's it, if it's uh, be done, if if the cluster is normally spread and not everything is running on the node that is uh, failing, uh, I have seen seven seconds. So. Yeah. Five seconds and the cluster needs, of course, to recognize that the other node is gone, yeah, and then the cluster will do its magic. And, it's, and the more nodes you have, the more it gets spread out, so you reduce the risk. Yeah. So in the moment, I have a little bit of a problem with my microphone. It has not enough battery left because I have this, uh, this nice, uh, nice, funky uh, uh, Bluetooth microphone. So I and you don't have spare batteries. <laughs> no, it's in there. So we have to oh. pause for 10 minutes, Didier. So we saw a nice uh, failover of the system. Uh, and uh, in the pause, I replugged the 5.7.0.2. It came up. Uh, it rejoined the cluster. It came up. And now we see it's handling at least one of those uh, uh, this is disk one now, and uh, here we see the I/O is still running. We can, of course, move the disk two to the other node. And but normally, should... normally it balances it out automatically, yeah. right? Yeah. But you see here, I moved the disk, and nothing was happening in our uh, in our uh, with our test benchmark system. I move it yeah. back, 
Yeah, as you see, it's it's running smoothly. So now we go to our to um, our third uh, um, system. You remembered where is it? I have to search for it, of course. Too many windows. So here we are on our third system with the three JBots, and uh, yes, also a scale-out file server running. We have disks here, also two of them. They are a little bit bigger. They are nearly 10 terabytes big, and we have a pool. And you asked me if there is uh, enclosure awareness implemented. I hope so. Get storage pool. We will see. Oh, I, I have not an evaluated uh, PowerShell. We need that for this kind of PowerShell get storage pool. And That's it's called like pool it. one. Friend, friendly name pool zero one. And we will give all the, uh, all the, um, all the all the uh, properties so properties and here enclosure where the default is on true so every virtual disk that is created on this pool or in this pool is automatically automatically enclosure aware and uh, the enclosure awareness is something that is uh, defined on the virtual disk so if we do um give me every information of every uh, virtual disk here is enclosure where true so our virtual disks are enclosure where the data is spread over all three enclosures okay so now this is our system and i think we have uh, Carsten, yeah. the enclosure where capability does it of storage space? Does it reduce your available net storage space, or no? No, it uh, it only um, spread the data. So if one block is written in the first enclosure, it uh, automatically writes the second and third block. If you do a three-way mirror, or, or if uh, if you do a two-way mirror, only the second block in another enclosure. So yeah. if an enclosure fails, not the two blocks or the three blocks could be lost. So if it doesn't yeah. have the enclosure awareness and doesn't spread it over the enclosures, you could lose all your data. Yeah? So it's quite space efficient as well. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. So now we want, what we want to do, we want to do some I.O. I have, a, um, I have here on the cluster storage volume one, this is one of the virtual disks. I have, a, uh, I see it here. I have a, a directory with 700 gigabytes of data and we want to copy that onto the other virtual disk. So he has to do some I.O. and you see the screen <laughs> he's calculating. There's a lot of data in there. So we, we quite will not see some success, I hope. I, I not hope now, I see it. now you're missing ODX. Yeah. Now you're missing ODX. <laughs> <laughs> so this is there are a lot of files in there. Hmm. <clears throat> How can we handle that? Uh, copy less files? Perhaps. Yeah, but uh, okay, we can copy this. But it it will be will be too fast, so we don't maybe see what's happening. Uh, this was memory, writing into memory. Now it's going down a bit. So what could we do, Didier? He's still. You have the mouse, uh, let's, let's so you, you can... I, ha I have the mouse. Yes, uh, so if the I.O. Uh, drops or so, yeah, you, can, you can create more I.O. <laughs> so um, you can copy these two images, these two hard disks, to this volume. Yeah? So I, will, I still have the mouse. I will uh, quit this one. And you can take... Oh, there is the third one. We can take this two. These are 80 gigabytes and copy them here. Yeah. I hope so. I don't think I have mouse control anymore. Yes, you are moving the mouse. I'm moving the mouse. Okay. It's yeah, latency. 
Yeah, it's latency. You are in Belgium, I'm in Germany, and uh, it's a little bit latency. So I move one of those disks here, and it will. I don't know why why it's calculating. Here we see the data, yeah, and the time remaining is yeah. calculating. So we you watch maybe this one when we pull one of those okay. uh, JBots. So I'll Kathy, keep an eye on it. I'll try to I'll try to make it, uh, have a full queue of digital copy. Okay, so my wife will help me again, and we do a video. I go to the servers with the sweet J box. So here we see um, all disks are working. The, the load is spread it over the three J bots, and I will turn off one of those J bots. Did he, did, do you still hear me? I can still hear you. Okay, I will throw one power supply now. Wait, wait. Can you just no, no, I only turn on one. first? Now I have it okay. on clear on the on the, the screen. Okay. Can you can you explain it again? So now you see the EIO over is doing is spread it over all three J boards. You see here the the LEDs uh, going on and off. And I turned off one power supply at this table, so we see a red warning blinking. And I will turn. I will turn now off. Wait, wait. Where is it? I have to find it, of course. Here, I will turn it off. <laughs> Three, two, one. Now. So okay. the JBOT is off now. The data copy dropped to zero. Yeah. At 92 percent complete. Yeah. So it's okay. the JBOT is still doing some activities, not the one that is turned off, but the others, other two, have still activity. We will see it on the okay, video. Okay, it's it's starting again. Uh, uh, it's paused again. Yeah, uh, I've done this test sometimes. It, it, it takes a little bit to get the I/O on again. So now it's now we have a lot of activity on the JBot. No, yeah, it's, it's copying again. It's copying. Okay. Again. It's uh, again. So it conti it's continuing. So what you, do you think? How long uh, did it take? Uh, Less than a minute, I would say. Huh? It le less than a minute. I think okay. 30, 30, 40, 40 seconds. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Kerstin. I go back to. Yes. So we have that recorded, I hope. Uh, I did not shut down recording, so it should be good. Okay. So. I oh, sure nice. hope. These. So now we have done all our tests. <laughs> Didier, how do you feel about that? I like it. It's uh, like pretty it? impressive. I like it, and I also I also find that in storage spaces it seems to be very uh, space efficient, because I've seen some other solutions that do, uh, let's say, JBot uh, failure redundancy, but it comes at a high price in available storage, basically. Yeah. So in the moment, so. one JBot is off. The storage system is still working, and we have our two volumes here. We can use them. Uh, you see it's quite yeah. snappy to go in there. And, uh, and of course, how, how the larger your system is, if you have 10 JBots attached or 7 JBots attached to your uh, scale-out file server, the impact is reduced, basically. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think that should conclude our storage space scale out, uh, scale out file server session, or would you would you like to add some information? Well, I, was, I, I was about to ask about uh, the, the CSV cache and the data tiering, if you've got any comments or experiences yeah. with that. Yeah. Uh, um, um, the CSV cache is a very nice solution uh, where you have uh, a lot of data that is read, it's a read cache, in memory in the file servers. 
Unfortunately, when you use storage spaces in Windows Server 2012 R2, the CSV cache is turned off. So when you use storage spaces with a scale-out file server, you can't use memory in the scale-out file server as CSV read cache. If you use block storage, uh, we, don't talk, we didn't talk about that, but if you have block storage like you have, I know, we talked about that earlier, um, you can have CSV read cache in the scale-out file server. You, you put two or two to eight uh, scale-out file server nodes in front of your very fast compelling storage, for example, and you can use uh, CSV read cache in this scenario. Deduplication yeah. in the moment is not well supported with uh, storage spaces. There's only one scenario. Uh, Microsoft called it the VDI scenario. Yeah. So if you have VDI workloads on your storage spaces, you you can use deduplication for your VDI virtual machines and uh, have a nice Im performance improvement in booting the machines. Uh, for example, the boot yeah. storm is uh, is something they talk a lot of uh, about. If you have a lot of virtual machines that are booting at the same time, so maybe all your um, employees start work or start working at eight o'clock in the morning. All yeah. of them turn off their machine, uh, you have a boot storm. 100, 200 virtual machines are starting from the same storage system. There, okay. there is an advantage when you use uh, um, deduplication on storage spaces, but this is the only supported scenario. So I normally yeah. don't and use uh, um, deduplication on storage spaces. Yeah? I'm, I'm testing it on a, on a, I'm testing that on a, on a couple of uh, server VMs just to see what's happening. It's yeah. not supported. It's not a very important. It's, they're not very important VMs, but you know just just to see what's happening. Uh, the the point is, of course, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there in in, in uh, future versions. Yeah, and another thing that's that's available in storage spaces is write cache. Does yeah. that have any impact on uh, storage spaces? Um, yes, if you have storage spaces uh, and auto tiering or, or SSDs and HDDs, um, the system will use a small portion, actually a one gigabyte portion for every virtual disk uh, in SSD. Yeah? Maybe you have, we would say, also if you only want, if you only use HDDs, and it finds SSDs also in the pool, it will use a small portion for the, the write-back cache. And when I first saw the write-back cache, I, I, I was thinking, so why only one gigabyte? Let's, let's use 50 gigabytes or 100 gigabytes. And in the moment, the product group says, don't mess with this gigabyte setting. We tested a lot and gigabyte is, uh, is quite nice. And the write back cache is only used in a specific scenario. Um, I think it's the random write scenario. So if you have uh, random write peaks, uh, the, the um, um, write back cache in SSD is used. I, don't, I okay. hope I didn't mess it with the uh, a sequential write, but I'm pretty sure it's a random write. Yeah? So, so basically, it, it's a bit like the the write back cache on RAID control. It's a bit like that, but not every I/O is uh, cached there. Yeah. yeah. So, and if it's written to SSD, afterwards it has to be written to HDD. Yeah. So the storage system has to read the stuff again from the SSDs and write it to the HDDs. So the I.O. is going to your storage system once in SSDs, then it has to be read again from your storage system and write again. So it's yeah. not it's not a, a solution in the moment for every I.O. And uh, some people that heard, hear about storage space, I want to add that, think if you have SSDs, every I.O. is first going to SSDs and afterwards to HDDs. That's not the case. Yeah, um, many I/O is going to HDDs, and only if it's hot data, for example, or a small portion is going to SSDs. So it's can not you, like a yeah. Please? Can you tweak what's hot and what's not? I don't think so, and yeah. there uh, there is no official way, and I don't know of any way how to manipulate the heat map. No, I, I have I have to say that I, I've seen a lot of people who who first buy. 
uh, tiering solutions, whether it's storage spaces or something else, that they tend to, you know, they want to tweak it, they want to mess around with it, they want to adjust it to their circumstances. But in the end, I, my experience with data tiering is, unless it's not working well for some reason, you just have to accept it and leave it alone and let the thing do its magic because it's over time yeah. that it that it provides its benefits. In that in that in that regards, it's a bit like OnMap. Yeah. Don't try it's, to force it. Don't try to make it real time. Yeah. Just let it work behind yeah. the scenes and optimize. Right. Yeah. That's very important what you are saying. A very good point. Uh, it it takes time. Not ev the the system has to learn which data is hot and which is cold. And your data is not static. So today maybe this data is hot and the last week was hot, but uh, then you maybe shut down this virtual machine. And now all the data is cold. Other data will yeah. be hot. So this is a learning and there's al always movement in, in uh, storage tiering. Some data is hotter than the other and if you have not enough SSDs, the hotter data will remove the not so hot data. It's still hot, but it's there is more. There is hotter data there. I don't know how to how to phrase it correctly. Yeah. It's hotter, so it will remove the all, all also hot data into HDDs. So yeah, it um, prioritizes yeah. the data based on how active it is, basically. Exactly, and uh, um, you you said you don't tweak it maybe but uh, i have to add uh, maybe not for everyone this 1 am auto tiering process is the right one maybe okay. you're doing backup at uh, in the time of uh, okay, time sure, around sure, 1 sure. am so it's a task uh, you can tweak it if you said maybe at 11 o'clock there is not so much io in my system you uh, you change the time of the auto tiering process to 11 uh, 11 yeah. o'clock in the evening. Maybe you want but to, basically to have that's, two. But basically, yeah? that's that's a timing. That's a timing and a frequency tweak. That's not messing around with the algorithm yeah. or trying to change what exactly, is considered yeah. hot or not. Yeah. But it's in, it's completely in your hand. The the product group says 1 a.m. one auto tiering process per day. You can do more than one. They uh, they said not um, often than six hours. Yeah. yeah but you can also say I only want to do my auto tiering at the weekend. Okay. So you are free how to to change it. And another important question that I often hear: How much SSD to HDD? What is a good? Um, the magic is, number. The magic, the magic number. How what? Uh, yeah. How much SSD I really need? And there is not really a good answer for that because it completely depends on your I.O., what I.O. you yeah. have. So you can what, say... If, what kind of workload are you running? Yeah. Uh, you can say, then more, more SSDs you have, more data can be in it, and more, more data will be served from SSD. But of can course, it, can, more SSD has the price. So you yeah, have can, to get a nice point for that. A nice can it be point. too big? Can it be too large? Or does it just keep adding data that's less hot? That's hot. No, I think it it uses, I think it uses really the SSD tier. Um, I don't know if there will be free data there. Uh, you you saw in my example, uh, we need 80 gigabytes. So if I remember the number correctly, I have an SSD tier of 150. I don't Is know if the other uh, 70 gigabytes would be free. I would assume that also some cold data is in there, and there is not yeah. data that is cold with zero degrees but maybe it's like a it's like a temperature you have very cold data that is not touched for a year or so and you have cold data that is only touched uh, every two weeks and then you have hot more more uh, more hot data that is touched maybe every day once or twice and you have very hot data that is used all the time so okay. i assume that also cold data gets into the ssd tier no, but I don't know exactly. Um, but I, there is a there is a um, percentage that Microsoft gave out to the public how much SSD tier you should have, and they said on, on Tech at uh, North America. Actually, I think it was Brian Matthews in his talk that uh, they tested a lot internally, and they found that eight percent SSD tier would be a very nice number to have. 
So this is but 8% sounds not so much, but when you use storage spaces, you have to know every disk in this JBOT has to be an SAS disk or a SAS SSD. You can't use normal SATA SSDs. And, uh, it's shared are, storage. Right? It's shared storage, yes, of course. So the SAS SSDs are a little bit more expensive than enterprise SATA SSDs. Yeah? And imagine you have a four terabyte HDD. And if you have, if you want to have 10% SSD, you have to add to every four terabyte HDD a 400 gigabyte SSD. Yeah? Yeah. To have this 10% SSD to HDD. Yeah. So this is quite expensive. Your four terabyte HDD maybe has a price of 400, 500 euros or so as, as an enterprise from, an, from a vendor, maybe you get it for 300 to 400 euros, but the 400 gigabyte enterprise SAS SSD, <laughs> it has a price between 1,000 and 2,000 euros. So it's quite expensive to have 8% in SSD. Maybe you, your workload is fine with 4% or 2% even. Yeah? So yeah. in general, you can say, m when you have more SSDs, you have more I.O. out of SSD tier, but maybe you don't, you, you, you need a sweet spot for the price because in a scale out file server with storage spaces, the SSDs are very expensive. They have a high percentage of your total cost of your storage space solution. Yeah. I keep hoping that prices will keep coming down. They, they are coming down and they SSDs are they are in coming storage down. spaces are much cheaper than in maybe enterprise storage systems, I assume. Yeah, that's for sure. That yeah. is, no, 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 that's not an assumption. That's uh, that's guaranteed. Okay. The prices, the, the prices of, of SSDs from, let's say, traditional storage vendors are, are really out there. Yeah. You, you can expect anything between 4,000 and 8,000 euros sometimes. Yeah. It's, but um, I would yeah. assume you, you saw a Dell solution. Dell is one of the vendors who is supporting <coughs> storage spaces. And you get yeah. officially SSDs over Dell, and I don't know. I don't know if they can say, "Oh, in the compellent, the same SSD has a, has, is three times more expensive than in a storage space Dell solution." So I assume they will be the prices that's will an, be that's an, that's an interesting remark, actually. Yes, if if they are the same SSDs, that's an interesting remark. Yeah, yeah maybe I, we 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 had to look. We, we maybe have to look into that. So if you, for your compellents, will get a, uh, an offer for SSDs, we can look what the prices are and if they are the same, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Didier, this is already an hour, I guess. Uh, um, yeah, we I, have I, showed some nice so. things. Yeah. Uh, and Absolutely. I'm looking forward to our new show. I would assume it's about new stuff. Huh? I know you are playing already a lot of with the new stuff. Yes, we are. We want to make sure that we uh, get all the benefits of our software assurance left and right. So <laughs> we are, we're already looking at uh, where we can improve things because basically we're on a quite a, a quite a modern stack. Well, the latest of the greatest, and uh, we just want to see where where we can push things further. Even yeah, I would say our next uh, show would be uh, in the late November, I guess, because we are on the MVP summit. TechEd is now TechEd Europe is in in the near Next, future. Yeah. We have Very a nice conference in Berlin where you also will speak, and maybe That's after correct. that we will do another show. Well, uh, well, immediately after that, the 18th, I'm in in Holland for live experts. Okay. So, so I'm doing a little road trip after the MVP summits in Europe. Uh, <laughs> But it's all it's all good. It's uh, sharing knowledge, sharing experiences, seeing how it how it can work, uh, because I think it's important that people see that it really does work. But you have to set it up right, and you have to test. Testing is yeah. very important. Yeah, uh, right. yeah. just and make sure that you got the, the right components and that it works. But if you can if you can do that, uh, we've had some really great successes with it. So. Yeah. And maybe we can talk with our other uh, MVP amigos after Tech at Europe and after the MVP summit a little bit uh, about what's new in VNext, what we can talk about, of course. And one of them will have uh, an experience to share presenting at Tech at. Oh, yeah, Aiden is presenting at Tech at Europe. Yes, uh, we yes, talked yes, about yes. His, uh, 
winning the speaker idol, of course, and uh, Packet is not there anymore. That's, that's, Packet, yeah. But that's for the states. Well, Pepsi is. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I hear that, you again. That, that's for the United States, right? So I hope his his uh, his prize from uh, speaker idol carries over to Microsoft Ignite. Yeah, I hope so. The new one. But he's 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 uh, he's got his own full blown session at uh, TechEd Europe, and that's uh, yeah. that's awesome. Let maybe do a, a session in October, uh, in November, with uh, our four MVP amigos, and let's talk maybe about TechEd if the others ha can make time for that. Okay, a, sounds like a plan. Something looking forward to, huh? And Absolutely. After, and after that, we can do the great things in Vnext. Uh, we know yeah, there yeah. are great things coming. And we can't wait to talk about if we are allowed to, huh? Well, as far as I know, at the moment, everything we know uh, is uh, mostly what's published publicly, yeah. perhaps with some T-bits left and right. But, you know, I mean, everybody ha can ha can, who has an MSDN subscription, you know, they can have get their hands on the technical preview bits. You can you can start playing with it if you want. That's and right. it's it's free for all to discover, right? Just yeah. Just read what's available and start playing. Yeah, right. Nice last sentence. Uh, I would say goodbye, Didier, to, uh, to, to Belgium. And it uh, was nice uh, talking to you again. And I'm looking forward to, to today in two weeks, we will meet in uh, Bellevue and the Redmond. Okay, same to you. And thanks for the great demos. Nice. Bye. Bye.